Yeah, hello everybody. I'm Peter Leko. I'm very happy to be doing my first Pantablix also. Let's see how it goes. and welcome back to chess 24 i hope you got something to eat got some rest after that absolutely thrilling and sensational semi-final match that we had uh, because now it's time to sit back get some popcorn and enjoy this q a with uh, one of our legends peter leco let's welcome peter on the show welcome peter yeah hello tanya hello everybody and uh, of course peter Played in the Legends of Chess tournament, Peter was also uh, the challenger to the World Championship match in 2004. He challenged Vladimir Kramnik to the crown. It was an absolutely epic World Championship match where Peter was just half a point away from becoming the... Peter, was it the fourth, 15th World Champion? No. I think so, yeah. I'm always <laughs> also mixing up, but yeah, it would have been the 15th, yeah. <laughs> The 15 world champion and what an epic match that was. It ended with 7-7 seven, seven score, but back then the reigning world champion had the right to remain world champion without a tie break or a playoff if the score was level. Peters, of course, won several elite events like Linares, like Dortmund, and we saw some absolutely thrilling play by Peter in the Legends of Chess. Now, Peter, I know the score, the score line didn't go according to plan. But the quality of chess and the games it themselves were very exciting, very narrow margins that you lost out on, some on Armageddon. Now that you've had a couple of days rest, your impressions of the tournament? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, it, it was a fantastic event. I was very happy to, to be part of it because uh, it was so great to play all these uh, fantastic players. I mean, okay, with many of them, uh, yeah, we had... I think Kramnik, Anand, and Ivan Chuka, the, the three players with whom I played the most games in my career. And okay, now we had some new battles. It, it, was, it was amazing, but also a very special feeling to, to be able to play Magnus again, because I haven't played with Magnus for quite a while. And it was a very, very nice feeling to, to, to see and to feel that, uh, yeah, I can still compete with anyone. Yeah, finally the result wasn't exactly going to plan, but it was probably uh, also based on uh, lack of practice. I mean, simply there was no match when I was not given at least one present to my opponent. And it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to, to come back from that in this field. And they punished me for that. I mean, how many times I lost the last game? It was just insane. I think from the first six matches i lost five times the the last game and it was driving me crazy completely you know i i can imagine and indeed your match against magnus carlson was was one of the very difficult matches for magnus in the qualifiers i think in at least three games you had a big advantage in the rapid games and uh, like i was saying i think that was one of the few matches that magnus really struggled in uh, things didn't turn out. Looking back at it, which match would you say you're most proud of in the Legends of Chess? Well, actually that one against Magnus because uh, it, it was really a very, very great matchup. Uh, I, I managed to get uh, really nice pressure in, uh, in the first three games. And uh, it was not because of some extraordinary preparation or something, but simply I got some type of positions which I felt very nicely. And, uh, and I managed to, I mean, especially the first one, because it was like a street fight, but I felt like Magnus is maybe provoking me and I managed to, to outplay him step by step. However, the way he defended that, that unpleasant position was, uh, was quite, quite something. I mean, playing fast 
putting the pressure on uh, for me on the clock and uh, creating always some chances. Yeah, so I could never really lean back and play some move from from hand. I always had to calculate, and uh, while calculating, you are burning more time. You are getting more confused, and then you just feel like ah, Magnus escaped. Yeah, and it happened in two more games. Uh, and and that's uh, at the same time you feel very proud that okay you got so close. On the other hand, you are also very upset that you yes. let it slip because how many times do you get these positions against Magnus? Yeah, I mean I'm pretty yes. sure that if we would have a chance to play another match, I would never ever get so close now in in my games of uh, of beating Magnus. I don't know how the Peters, all the Peters around us are so modest. I have no idea, but uh, Peter, there's been. A few days now. It's been about two or three days. It was a brutal format. It was nine days without any rest, rapid play, then Armageddon. I mean, I think, I think one of the toughest formats in the entire Magnus Carlsen Chester because we had no break day. Have you recovered or still feeling the tiredness from it? Yeah, I think this is such a tournament that once it's over, you really feel the tiredness and uh, you need quite some time. I mean, just few days. It's it's not enough because. With every day, I feel myself more and more exhausted. And uh, okay, also we have some terrible heat. I'm trying to to go biking in the evenings because in the evenings it's uh, kind of already possible to to get uh, get out. But we have 30 plus degrees, and uh, that was also one of the issues. That yeah, playing at home, it's uh, not the usual uh, chess atmosphere. Yeah, You're, usually you go to some uh, uh, tournament, you are playing in a nicely air conditioned uh, atmosphere and uh, suddenly at home with at AC it's uh, it, it was quite some challenge i mean there were some games when i had uh, shower between the games as well i mean it was it was quite some challenge all right well peter the good news is that <laughs> that you you can now take some rest uh, this q and a session peter is something that we are doing with all the legends it's part of the entire Le legends of chess tour and we've received a number of questions from your fans and your followers and uh, i'll be asking them one by one of course they're also a very big fan of your commentary peter so i think we're probably going to be getting some questions on that as well let's start with the first question by master gambit and he says hi peter you train Vincent Kema. Do you use a special training method with special thoughts on pedagogy and didactics? Or do you train purely by feeling? Will there be a book about your training method? What's your training method, uh, Peter? Well, I mean, with Vincent, uh, basically, we are mostly working on openings because, I mean, if you are a coach who is working with someone every day, then you have a lot of time for many things. But if uh, you are not meeting like every day, then it's, it's very difficult. And I felt like, you know, it was the moment when I started working with Vincent, when he was still just, he just turned 13. Yeah, during that tournament in Tarvizio in the under 20 championship, when he was still 12, when we started and during the tournament, he turned 13. And at that tournament, you know, it was like a very, uh, very special moment because I, when there is a coach without ever coaching Vincent at all. Yeah, so it was the first time we, we really talked about chess uh, together and uh, I had the chance to, to see him, how he plays, uh, how he analyzes, what he thinks about his games. And uh, during this uh, tournament, I realized that, okay, he's an exceptional talent. And uh, I think uh, we should be working together later on as well. And then suddenly, a few months later, sensationally, Vincent won the Grenke Open and yeah. got the chance to play against the world's elite at the age of 14. I mean, it was, uh, it was something uh, incredible. I mean, Vincent earned the spot. And uh, then, okay, the main question was how to compete with the super guys. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. And uh, we created uh, our main target was to get him such a repertoire that uh, he can really play a good tournament. I mean, the result doesn't really matter, but it's important that you get decent positions and you can play chess. It's not like you are overall uh, in the opening and you have zero chance. And actually in this uh, respect, uh, we did incredibly well. 
I mean, uh, Vincent was playing a very good tournament. I mean, the result was not that great, but who cares about the result? But the games, I mean, he was, he had Magnus on the ropes, he had yeah. uh, Fabio on the ropes, and uh, yeah, he was getting also more and more confident out of the tournament. So basically, that was uh, that one year went purely for for openings. And uh, of course, during our sessions, we are also discussing his games. Uh, but he's a very good chess player, so it's, <laughs> I mean, uh, you cannot really just tell him something. And he's also a very clever boy. He knows so many things. So basically, I feel like, uh, yeah, I really have to help him in the openings because everything else he already does very well. Peter, you sound like a very, like a very passionate trainer who's you know, very emotionally also involved in his career. Now, while you were playing the Legends of Chess, Vincent was playing at Beale. Uh, were you in touch with him? Were you following his games? Because I'm sure that you were. But tell us about, uh, about the contact during these two big events. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this was a very, very special moment because it also felt like, why is this happening to me? Yeah, that finally I got a chance to play in a fantastic event. And it exactly clashes with the only tournament which Vincent is playing in, in half a year. I mean, and exactly almost day by day it clashed. So yeah, before we had some uh, preparation for the tournament, uh, already the last couple of months. And uh, finally he went to the tournament. We didn't really know what, what will happen. I mean, how we will do it. Because I told him that I would like to help you, but I, I cannot promise. Uh, what will happen and then during the the tournament the legend started and I realized that I even don't have energy to prepare for myself because if I prepare for myself I don't have energy to play the four games so okay. it was a very tricky situation and then if I even in the night will work for Vincent then it will just be impossible and uh, Vincent started very well in the tournament he got a lot of confidence and then he was telling me like yeah yeah of course yeah you don't have to work just focus on your on your own tournament and he was looking at my games I was looking at his games of course every evening we would talk for half an hour or one hour discussing the opponent but more like strategic wise and also one of the things my method of teaching chess is to to help Vincent learn how to work himself so actually he knows how to work he knows how to prepare for the opponent and uh, i really felt like he's doing extremely well uh, i remember that whenever i saw because they started at two o'clock in bill and he started from four so whenever he had a good position before i started my match i felt like a boost i was really very happy and aha uh -huh, so vincent has chance of winning so i also got the extra energy and when he had some uh, tough position or it felt like, yes, yeah, something went wrong, it's not, not according to plan, like against Adams. I mean, Mickey in, uh, in, in the classical game nicely outsmarted him in the opening. Then I was, you know, like uh, thinking almost always about this game that will Vincent survive or not. That, that was kind of a tough emotional challenge. You know, it's it's reminding me, Peter, of in fact BL last year where you were playing the the main grandmaster event and Vincent was playing in the masters, the BL masters. And I actually had a game with Vincent. I don't know if you remember this, but you, every move you would come down and you would watch the game. It was almost like you were more invested in his game than your own game. Yeah, well, this is actually one of the problems as a player that once you start to be a, like a coach, then you actually think much more about other things than yourself. And this, this, is a, this I felt like was missing for me during the whole Legends tournament that this incredible will to, to succeed yourself. Um, and maybe this was also connected that I was losing these four games because you, you need this incredible energy for the games and uh, you have to have your ego and so on. But as a coach, you you little bit lose this. Yeah, and, uh, and somehow really, uh, almost I feel like Vincent's results are more important for me than my uh, results personally right now. Uh, but uh, that's how times are changing, that's, that's life. And I really believe that uh, Vincent has very, very good chances of becoming a really very, very big player and I want to help him as uh, much as I can. 
because I also got so much help from Germany. So actually, maybe people don't really know this, but as a child prodigy, I got a lot of uh, support, financial support, which uh, helped me to finance my trainings and so on. In Hungary, it was very, very difficult to get any support. So I'm uh, very, very grateful for Germany to, to help me. So it's also from my heart, I'm very happy that I can give back something. And uh, I'm really hoping that Vincent will be a very big player. That's incredible to hear. And I'm, I have no doubts about that. He is a super talent. And like you said, uh, uh, he is a very, very strong player and he's extremely young. No doubt he's going to go very far. And Peter, you're going to have a big role to play in that. Let's move on to the next question. It's by Kramnik student. And Kramnik student says, hello, Peter, you're an excellent commentator and your banter blitz show was great. Any chance of you writing a book along the lines of the Bobby Fisher I knew? Looking back, how do you view the draw offer to Kramnik on the 12th game of the 2004 match? So the first question is about writing a book about the experience with Bobby Fischer. And for some of you who might not know this, but Bobby actually stayed in Peter's home. Uh, it was after the 92 match when Bobby could not return to the United States and was in Hungary for a while. He was in Budapest. He spent time in Judith's household. He spent time in Peter's household. So... Any chance of you writing a book along the lines of the Bobby Fisher you knew is the first part of the question. <laughs> well, actually, not really. I mean, I'm not uh, planning to write uh, a book about this. First of all, I, I got to know Bobby just by accident. I mean, it was like 98, 99. So he had already been quite a long period in, in Hungary. And I always felt like, you know, that I don't want to disturb him. So if he will ever give me a chance to meet him, I will be very, very happy because, okay, Bobby is, is Bobby. It's just incredible. I mean, uh, so of course I'm very happy, but uh, if he doesn't want to be fined, I don't want to find him. Yeah. And I somehow felt like that's exactly the reason why we got so close later on when we finally by accident managed to, to meet that I never wanted anything from him. So he, I don't have any autograph. I even don't have any uh, picture together taken and so on. Uh, he could, he always felt like, okay, whenever he comes to me, to Seged, then he has his complete privacy. If nobody will know anything. And uh, I want to keep all these memories like this. Of course, I have shared a couple of uh, stories and it's uh, not a secret that I really met him, but somehow I, I feel like exactly our friendship and our relationship was based on this, that uh, I, I never wanted to, to, to make any big noise out of it. I'm just very, very happy that I had the chance uh, meeting Bobby and got to know him as a person so I can judge him much, much better. And uh, I mean, what he showed me in, in chess, because we never really worked, yeah? But I was working and he was watching me work on chess, wow. yeah? This was, this was normal for him. So he was in my working room, I'm analyzing and he's looking. And then some time to time, he's sometimes falling asleep. Uh, because we didn't have AC, it was also very hot in those summer times and so on. Then he would wake up, he would look again what I'm looking at, and uh, he would tell me that, wow, how deep I'm analyzing. At the same time, he would suddenly, you know, look at the position and, and then just smash out, bang out the best possible move. And with such a clear vision, because, I mean, okay, you can bang out out of intuition or something, but just in this fraction of seconds, he went so incredibly deep into the positions uh, and uh, not just by accident, he suggested the best move, but he already understood why he's doing this. And mm -hmm. okay, this personal experience, I will cherish all my life because this is something uh, incredible. I mean, I have been already almost top 10 player, like top 15. And suddenly I, I felt like, wow, that's Bobby Fischer. Yeah, that's why he was the, the number one, the world champion, the absolute legend. Because, because if you can do something like this, then you are truly special. So even in 92, you could feel his class over the no, board. This was when in 99. He... It was in 99. Oh, yeah, okay. This, this was in 99 because I only met him, like I said, in 98 and 99. So he had been in Hungary for the long period, but I didn't right. manage Sorry. to meet him. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that, was, uh, that was the moment. And actually talking about 92, it's very nice that you mentioned this 92 because he had this match against uh, Boris Pasky uh, in Sveti Stefan. And me as a child prodigy, you know, it felt like, aha, okay, this is some nostalgic match. 
okay, we are playing good, but I could already compete yeah, with them. And it was, it was the Peter Lego, age 13, who had such thoughts, yeah? And then luckily, six years later, when I was already almost uh, absolute top player, or already uh, top player, then suddenly I had this personal experience and I managed to realize how great Bobby is, yeah? And that, that's why I thought this is so special and I'm so grateful for, for the destiny that it gave me this chance. And did you also play a lot of Blitz or Fisher Random with him in that period when you met him in 98, 99? No, the point was that he never really wanted to play. And I mean, he, he will be very careful, you know, it's, uh, I understand him perfectly because I'm now also playing less and less. And just before this uh, Legends tournament, I was completely confused. I mean, I haven't been playing on this level for many, many years. I haven't really been preparing myself, my own openings uh, in the last couple of years. And I'm going to play against the greatest players. Uh, and online, which is even not my territory, because I haven't been playing the last 10 years uh, online chess at all. So I didn't know what to expect. And it's very nice that people have seen my first experience in Bunter Blitz, that how shaky I was. I mean, just making a single move cost me like three, four seconds. Uh, the only preparation I did for the Legends tournament was to get a nice chair, which I'm sitting on uh, right now. And I also got a very nice mouse, which I'm still... I don't think I'm using it even to, to 50% that I could, but at least it gave me some stability. So this was, uh, and exactly for this reason, I'm also not, uh, I mean, I'm not ashamed or I'm, I don't really care that I got last. First of all, somebody had to be last. And uh, if I would have not been last, then it would have been wishy or it would have been ding. You know, it shows what a tournament it was. Exactly. And uh, yeah, it was just a really special feeling uh, feeling to be to be part of it. I, I also felt like Ding was incredibly professional in his in this last round. And I almost felt like this was my toughest match. It was the match where I had the least chances of, of winning because it felt like he really wanted to make sure that he will not finish last and he was ready to do everything for it. It was, you're absolutely right in that pointing out that it's crazy when the bottom of the table has players like yourself and Vishy Anand and Dingler and it's just a, it's a pure reflection of how brutal the tournament was. Uh, there we have the standings of the qualifiers. But let's move on to the second part of Kramnik student's question, which was looking back, how do you view the draw offer to Kramnik on the 12th game of the 2004 match? Yeah, actually, one of the things I want to mention that there had been already quite some books. I think Barayev wrote a book about uh, this match with, uh, between Kramnik and, and me. There was also a book of Karsten Hensel on this match. And I feel like uh, it's time that I rewrite my own book. Uh, and it's, 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 it's in my heart. I, I really want to write it just to write from my side what really happened. And to be honest, yeah, every, many people uh, were writing about this 12th game. I have zero regrets for, for this uh, specific game because, I mean, I was under incredible pressure. Uh, it was like uh, Kramnik hit me with some very strong novelty once again in the match. And uh, I had to spend a lot of, lot of time. I was making incredible defensive moves, but I was during the whole game under pressure and on the defensive. And, uh, you know, it was also very funny because uh, this final position is the only position where finally, objectively, maybe I'm better. But uh, just one move before, two moves before, I mean, Kramnik could have forced a draw whenever he wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. he was, but he was pressing and he was done on the, on the score. So it was clear that he, he, he wants to, to win this game at all. Uh, and I had less time. But what happened in this game? Uh, in the game happened that I had five minutes, Kramnik had six minutes, and we had no increment back then. Yeah, and there were still quite a lot of moves, still move 40. And uh, like two moves back, I already felt like that if I reach this position, then uh, I can go for this position because, okay, he has a perpetual check, but I don't mind the perpetual check. Uh, and with this move, then I offered the draw. Uh, basically with the, with the feeling that, okay, he has the perpetual check. So if he wants to continue, he takes the risk. If he agrees to a draw, then it's anyway like if he would have given the perpetual check during the game. And then Kramnik starts to think, 
uh, he was thinking like for five minutes, so he got down to one minute on the clock. And many people, when finally the draw was agreed, they saw that Kramnik had one minute on the clock. And in the meantime, the engines understood that there is no draw anymore for, for white actually in the position. But I mean, this was, uh, this was a very special moment. I also, during this time, while he was thinking, 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 I realized that actually the perpetual that I saw that he always has this blowish mechanism, uh, it does not work. Actually, it does not work. But on the other hand, he can also just continue with the move, like knight f5. If somebody checks the game, then can understand that okay, white can just play knight f5 and play for compensation. And with uh, five minutes on the clock, uh, for uh, for still seven or eight moves, it it could have gone either way. Uh, basically, maybe most probably it would have been a draw anyway, because it was very much logical that this game ends in a draw. Uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, later on, uh, it felt like, uh, yeah, maybe I should have not offered this draw, but it was a very intuitive decision and it was already made like two, three moves back. And I was done to five minutes, Kramnik had still actually more time. Um, and he could have forced the repetition or perpetual check whenever he wanted. So. I have no regrets for this game. Right. Yeah. Because also when you're playing, you know, your moment decision is not based on that particular moment, but also what has preceded all of that and the tension from the previous moves. So all of that only I think the player playing realizes it. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I was completely shocked when I read the, the book uh, that it was kind of the whole story was based on that, that the reason why I didn't become world champion because I should have never offered the draw in that specific moment. And since I offered the draw, it shows that I don't have champion's character. And you know, to be honest, I felt that this, this was quite rude. I mean, because first of all, it had nothing to do with the situation. And yeah. uh, Kramnik was actually thinking and going down from six minutes to one minute exactly for this reason, because he did not want to draw from this position. He was also searching for more and finally very unhappily he agreed to a draw and in the book it was written that Kramnik with big happiness took the draw with both hands and uh, that was the psychological moment that aha so Kramnik is back and uh, then later went on to, to equalize the score. So that's exactly the reason why I feel like you know there are so many things to tell and uh, you I You have to I write a book Peter, book. you have to write a book. <laughs> yes exactly. <laughs> Because I think in that match, the game eight with Queen D3 is uh, definitely one of the games that deserves a big chapter in your book, as well as this. We look forward to that. But Peter, let's move on to the next question. And it's by Sergei Rachmaninoff. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. And Sergei says, Dear Peter, what is your take on the evolution of chess at the highest level? When asked on Chess24 live stream commentary, which generation understands chess better? Judith said straight away the older generation. Do you agree with her? That's the first part of the question. And then it goes on with being wise world champion. You have faced the greats of the past and current generation. Who has impressed you the most? So let's start with Peter, who you believe. Is it the previous generation or the current generation who has a better understanding of the game? <laughs> well, I mean, this is, this is, of course, a very, very tricky question. I mean... Uh... I would go back in time and I would like to say that uh, I'm very, very happy and grateful for, for all this, what happened in my chess, chess career, that I was coming at the end of 80s and I started playing in the beginning of 90s, uh, all the tournaments, so I somehow felt like I knew so many different generations, yeah? Uh, so when I finally came to this uh, first super tournaments, then Viktor Korshnoi was there, Predrag Nikolic was there, Artur Yusupov was there. I mean, all these players and I learned so much from them. Uh, and I feel like maybe that's exactly the reason why uh, Judith also said like, uh, yeah, maybe the older generation has better understanding, so-called more classical. But uh, the, the point is that, I mean, the modern chess became so concrete and there are so many different elements which are so important right now, which most probably the younger generation has, which we don't have. Yeah, I mean, how to handle the clock, 
For example, for me, one of the most uh, biggest problem is the increment. I just hate the increment. I cannot play with increment. And uh, can you imagine any other player, if you ask him, uh, that me personally, I would say that I prefer time travel with one minute on my clock for 10 moves without an increment compared to one minute on the clock for 10 moves plus increment, 30 seconds, you know, because these 30 seconds makes prolong somehow this, uh, this time pressure for me artificially too long. And my heart is not able to, to, to take this for such a long period. But if I only have this one minute and I know that I have to make 10 moves, uh, then I, I will actually be quite quiet and play quite good 10 moves. But with the implement, I make some terrible blunder because of this pressure with my heart, you know, and I, that's why I hate this uh, feed, new feeder time control that uh, all the big tournaments are now this 40, 40 moves for 90 minutes with the 30 seconds increment. And even after the time trouble, you immediately only get 30 minutes for the rest of the game. And uh, this is exactly, you know, the, the thing that I hate the most. I love the seven hours time control because if it's seven hours time control, I have time to calm down. Now we, we already, we can get back to the root of the question, which was about understanding, but I just wanted to say that how many different elements are there, yeah? And that's why I, I don't really like to say that, aha, of course, our generation was better or not. Uh, no, no, I, I don't have this feeling, but probably simply because of the fact that we learned chess before the computer era, then we have also witnessed all these developments in the 90s when the engines were already there, but you would use the engine only to check your analysis because engines were just still way too weak to, to suggest themselves some real deep strategical ideas. So it was, I mean, if I, for example, close my eyes, I can almost like year to year, remember all the analysis that I made and which engine, uh, how it reacted in certain positions. And I'm also very grateful to this experience and to this feeling that I know how engines were developing also the last uh, 25 years. Yeah, this is, uh, this is quite a chess cultural heritage, I would say. And I know every single line, how it developed and which computer had which influence on it and why top players suddenly started to think the way they finally think about certain positions. With, with the time. So this I all find very, very fascinating. And the modern players have to deal now with completely different problems. And uh, that's why I say that one should simply respect every era's top players and all the players because, I mean, everybody is exceptional in his own way, in his own time. I think that's the reason why, Peter, a lot of the top players like yourself actually don't like commenting and comparing players from different generations. Because every era and every generation, the game evolves so much, the game changes so much that it's almost unfair to compare uh, players from different, uh, from different generations because of the strengths and the weaknesses that exist at that time. Sergey finishes his message by saying, thank you in advance for your answer. Congratulations for your great showing at the Chess Legends. Despite not qualifying, you played brilliant chess and keep raising the bar for the youngsters. So he wishes you all the best, Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, Sergei. And the next question is by Thuri and Thuri says, Hi, Peter. You're supposed to be one of the greatest positional players of all time. How did you train st your strategic skills to become this great at positional chess? And what advice would you give other players who want to improve their strategic skill? Yeah, another very tricky question. I think actually the way you approach chess has a lot to do with your childhood. It has a lot to do with your first trainers, uh, which influence comes to you the most in the, in the early times. Also, it has a lot to do with your character, personal character. So for me personally, all my coaches were kind of uh, more strategic players. And I always enjoyed uh, studying a lot of my favorite chess book actually was uh, the lectures of uh, Tigran Petrosyan, where he has some chapters and was describing things. I already felt like the way he's describing, I, I fell in love with him. I mean, it was just so much pleasure to read how he is uh, uh, giving these lectures. Uh, 
Uh, it's very personal. I mean, it, it, it was fascinating. I was reading it like 100 times. And uh, I was studying a lot of, a lot of positional games. I, I do remember that, uh, for example, in this uh, beginning of 90s also, I mean, whenever I saw Karpov playing some brilliant endgame, you know, from a seemingly completely equal endgame, he outplayed other world-class players. This had even bigger impact on me than when Gary Kasparov was sacrificing uh, incredibly the pieces and was making his opponents brilliantly. You know, it, it, this is always uh, personal. Uh, then there were some periods in time when suddenly I felt like, aha, already I know so much about this positional stuff. Now exactly in that period, suddenly I admired and liked much more all the very aggressive stuff. Yeah. And uh, this, this, this is a typical way because finally, uh, as a top player, you have to be universal. So of course, everybody has his preference that, uh, yeah, for example, for me, it's always the nicest if I get a nice position out of the opponent opening, uh, when I feel like I have things under control, even if I don't have any advantage, and then slowly, step by step, build up the advantage, and when I build my position, then the tactic will appear, yeah, and also the, uh, the, the concrete lines will really work for the, the better side. This was always my feeling and I always felt like if I play a logical good game, then I'm able to calculate brilliantly, I'm able to find very, very deep uh, attacking moves and so on, but it had to be logical. And I was never the one, I never really believed in forcing those things, yeah? So every, if, if I would start some kamikaze mode, uh, it, it would basically mean that I don't respect uh, chess. I mean, it's simply not my way of looking at chess. Yeah. If I start to attack my opponent and try to look for some direct way of winning, because I just don't believe in it. And I feel like it should be punished. And if I do this and will be punished, I will be even happy that, aha, uh -huh, yes, you see, Peter, I mean, you have to get back to it. your, yeah, what you believe and what you like the most. Uh, this is, uh, this is simply the, what I kind of always felt like and uh, strategically building up the position and then finally the tactics, uh, that's, that's the chess I, I really love all the time. Yeah, I think even in your commentary, Peter, the insights that you give, as well as your games and the choices that you make during the games, they're always extremely positionally sound and correct decisions, like a very logical thread of plan and the tactics sort of flow out of that foundation. I remember I did an interview with, Kram with Vladimir Kramnik and he actually said that According to him, the toughest world championship match was the one he played against you because it was just, you just don't make any mistakes over the board. So it's extremely hard to beat an opponent who makes, who doesn't make mistakes. Uh, and I think that's what we, that's what we see in your extreme insights in your positional and strategic play. Peter, the next question is by Crazy I am Five, And he says, dear Peter, thank you for doing the Q&A. As someone that has studied your games, I absolutely admire your love for orderliness in chess and as an approach to life in general. I would love to know a couple of things. One, when shall we expect your books on chess improvement? So Peter, when is the first book coming out? Good question. The, the, the real problem is I'm not a, not a good businessman. And uh, <laughs> I mean, once you, I mean, if it would be so easy that, okay, let's write the book and uh, that's it then it's not a problem. But I mean, everything connected with this, you have to find the publisher, you have to have some arrangements and so on. I mean, uh, this is, this does not come natural to me. And actually I always feel like this is blocking me in, uh, in, in writing a book because I, I have this desire and this feeling inside me that yeah, I should write already for quite some time. It's another question always about time. Yeah, if, uh, if you are very busy, you don't have time because I always feel like if I write a book, it has to be very good. So just writing a book is not interesting. So exactly that's the reason why I feel like uh, that I, I want to write from the heart. And if I'm ready to write from the heart, I need a subject in which I feel like I can give everything. And yesterday I joined the German broadcast and uh, during the, the interview or during the commentary, I was actually mentioning that I would really love to make a video series on how to beat the French. I mean, it was not the way I was putting it, but I was just saying that 
if I remember, I had incredible amount of very, very instructive uh, games. And uh, if you look at those games, you will see all kinds of openings ideas, all kinds of uh, middle game ideas, tactical ideas, strategical, everything basically. And the, the difference between uh, writing a book like this and writing a purely opening book is, is for me, for example, vital because if I would write a book about openings, if I want to write from my heart, I have to write my own openings, yeah? Uh, but I cannot reveal all my secrets in a book. But uh, for example, writing about the games that I have played, I can open my heart and I can just give everything, all the information, everything what I believe about these positions, about all these games, uh, without any problem. And uh, that's exactly the reason why I felt like this is maybe also a nice project. You know, when I hear you talk, I, I get the feeling that you're a perfectionist and uh, maybe that's also your approach in at chess as well as like you said that, you know, you have to have a good subject that you believe in. Do you think that you're a perfectionist? I think so, yeah. And this is, this is actually not good for chess, not at all. I mean, how many times, you know, I did not play some opening idea which later people used and won their games because I was not happy with something. Something was bothering me. Yeah, yeah and... Uh, and uh, you have to be much more practical to succeed. Yes. And uh, how, how many times also in the game, I always like to play a logical game. I want to outplay my opponent. And if I suddenly do something wrong, I was always not good at this, that if I make a mistake, my opponent makes a mistake, then uh, the logical trend of the game had ended. And suddenly my opponent uh, felt this momentum much more. But if I had things from the beginning till the end under control, then I was extremely strong. Yeah. So in, in this sense, uh, this sense, it's uh, the perfectionist. But even if you would look at my chess room, every single book is really sorted. It's beautifully done because just if there is one millimeter some, somewhere not fittingly put, it already disturbs me. It, it distracts me of, of analyzing. I'm not surprised to hear that, Peter. <laughs> but that's a very interesting insight that actually, if you are a perfectionist, very often you find this analysis and this opening idea. But then if there is one small detail missing in it, you end up not using it, but objectively and practically, it could be a very strong decision to play on the board because your opponent will not be able to solve the problems on the board. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, the, the other problem is that if you are working in a very serious way, you also expect your opponents to work in a very serious way. Yeah? So I always felt like, and one of the big uh, thing, and I listened uh, to, to Gary's comment uh, today, was very, very interesting. And uh, I immediately remember that, yeah, the point is that this generation, I mean, from like 99 and 2005 till Gary retired, I mean, uh, we were all playing uh, kind of the same chess. And everybody was taking chess incredibly seriously. I mean, working on your openings was, was very, very important. And you almost surely knew that your opponents will also know everything. Yeah, because simply you knew that everybody works the same way. And now with the new generation, somehow I feel like they are putting much more, uh, much more focus on practicality. So they are not working as scientific like we used to work. And there is also maybe a, another reason for it that simply now computers are so strong that if you are working extremely scientifically, then you just cannot play practically over the board at all because yes. it, it requires a completely different mindset. And um, those days it was still possible. And uh, somehow this we have also seen in the Legends tournament and I was sure right from the beginning that Yes, it seems like, yeah, the legends are getting older and okay, Boris is already in his 50s and okay, Chucky and so on. But I knew that this, this type of players can handle any situation because they always have this inner energy to, to go on because they love chess, they have worked on chess so much. So they will, they will survive. They will play nine, nine days, four games matches with Armageddon and so on without any problems, even against the younger generation, simply because of this incredible passion of the game and this love for the game. And this is a wow. uh, big driving force which should not be underestimated. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's very uh, inspiring to hear, Peter. And I think you're absolutely right that that is the reason that because in this brutal format to see them fight it out and fight it out till the very end and also hold their own was something uh, very inspiring. And I'm going to bring up Crazy IM's next part of the question because this is something that all of us want to know, Peter. And he says, how could fans get in touch with you? You don't have any social media accounts. Peter, no, no Twitter, can't find you on Facebook, no Instagram. How do people get in touch with you? What are they supposed to do? Yeah, well, actually, strangely enough, uh, people are slowly finding me on Skype. You know, this is very interesting because I have a secret name. It's not my name, but uh, suddenly during this uh, corona crisis, uh, people were finding me and I was like even shocked how they are finding me. And then they told me it wasn't even that difficult. You know, that was, that was one of the hilarious answers I was getting that it was not even that difficult. Uh, but uh, yeah, now that I'm uh, getting more and more involved in all this commentary and so on, I also have this feeling and I mean, really thank you all the fans, everyone. It gives me also so much pleasure and so much extra energy uh, hearing all these nice comments. And uh, yeah, I, I will have to think about something, yeah? I mean, I was hiding, hiding, but maybe I have to get out of my hide uh, sooner or later, because yeah, it's, it's really nice, of course, when you, you feel and you see that people appreciate what you are doing. No, Peter, it's definitely time to come out of the hiding now. I think you have too many fans to keep hiding. You can run, but you can't hide, Peter, for too long. Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I'm feeling now. <laughs> Okay, Peter, let's move on to the next question. And it's by James Evans. And James wants to know, hi, Peter, is there a particular move or series of moves which you would describe as the most shocking that you have witnessed? Would be interesting to hear your response. Thanks a lot in advance. Interesting question, Peter. So any move that comes to your mind, which or a series of moves that shocked you? Well, actually, many things have shocked me, but, uh, but I mean, right now, whenever somebody asks you a very, very direct question, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to answer. I mean, I remember that from my personal experience, uh, the move which I'm the most proud of of uh, all my chess career is the move that I played against Kramnik in uh, Dortmund tournament in 96, in the Grünfeld, where I sacrificed my queen for a knight. And uh, it was done after like 55 minutes of sorts. And it also had an incredible impact on Kramnik because he was actually prepared for that game. He, he was prepared in this opening and uh, he didn't find in the analyze. He missed this idea even in the analyze. It was, it was completely shocking. Then he spent like one hour and forced the draw immediately. And you know what, what is also very interesting that exactly this tournament was one of my most disastrous tournaments of my life. I don't remember, it was, I did some minus five or something, but uh, exactly during that, uh, that game, uh, I, during that tournament, I managed to play this game, which I still, uh, this move that I'm most proud of. Yeah, it was just unbelievable. Now you brought the chessboard, does it mean that, should I show it or? Let me try and bring it up if, uh, just give me a second, Peter. It'll be amazing if you can show it to us. I mean, okay, I can also, uh, also make, the, make the moves myself, but okay, it probably, might take some time. Peter, I'm, I'm hearing from our producer that he's just setting it up. So maybe we move on to the next question and we'll come back to this. And you can show us this move that, uh, according to you, is one of the most memorable moves that you have made on the board. The queen sacrifice that you just mentioned. Let's move on to the next question while we get the technical part sorted. And it's by Shark Pirat and... Again, apologies if I'm pronouncing that all wrong. But he says, hi, Peter. Thanks for your Q&A. Judith told a lot about the Hungarian chess and chess players and the great traditions of, the Hung of Hungarian chess. You told me in the German live stream today that you spent a lot of time in Germany and that influenced you a lot. Do you see any differences in the tradition of German and Hungarian chess? Or is this mainly based in the different political systems? Thank you for your insights. So the... <laughs> The differences between the cultural, uh, the traditions of German and Hungarian chess. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's very funny because, yeah, whenever you hear all these things, so somewhere people are successful, then you hear all these Soviet chess schools, then you ask the, the Russian players and they don't really understand what, what is it. It's simply the culture. And uh, 
in in Hungary the same. Yeah, we had uh, historically so many great players, but I cannot really explain it why it happened. And there is no system, or there is no chess school, or there there is nothing in in this regard which uh, would make it clear that why in Hungary people think about chess the way they think. <clears throat> but uh, for example, for me, of course, it was a fantastic feeling when I uh, started working with Andra Shadorian because, okay, his uh, vision, his view of chess and his preparation level back then was just uh, phenomenal. And uh, he helped me tremendously build up a very, very good black repertoire because after all for Andra, Black is okay, it was always very, very important. So my Grunfeld was uh, based on him. And I would say that uh, historically, one can say that uh, Hungarians always had a tendency to be good in openings. So maybe that's, that's the, the so-called Hungarian school, but it's not because somebody was teaching, but maybe uh, if I look back, then yes, when my first coach started to, to teach me, when I was like seven, eight years old, we immediately started building some repertoire. Yeah, it's like the logical way that you start working on chess, you have to have a repertoire. And uh, then of course it gets deeper and deeper, but uh, that's the first impulse. And uh, then when I was staying in Germany, I actually don't really know the, the German system that well because yeah i was visiting some chess clubs and i was staying in families so i was more learning a lot about german culture in general and uh, about the kindness of the people because i also did not really understand why exactly the germans have to have this feeling that this young hungarian chess prodigy needs our help you know and this i felt always humanly that it was so nice and uh, and i learned so much in this respect not, uh, not, uh, not chess-wise, that really they, they cared about me and they were thinking that how to help me to, to become a great player. And I'm very, very grateful for this. Right. Uh, all right, Bia, let's move on to the next question. And it's by Thomas R. And Thomas uh, uh, wants to know, I think I'm going to pick up a part of this question, which is very interesting, is about your feeling during Kramnik's Marshall disaster, I think this is referring to game eight of the world championship match. Were you initially worried, scared? And if so, when did you start realizing that his preparation was just losing? And just to give a little backdrop, I think to our viewers that, you know, of course, Vladimir Kramnik was considered to be, a, to be an absolute beast when it came to opening preparation. I think opening preparation, Peter, was one of the biggest uh, things which made him win the 2000 match as well. And uh, in that game, in game eight, when you took the lead, I think it's really interesting to hear this. What were your insights when you saw and when you realized that actually there was a hole in his preparation? And did you find that over the board, the entire sequence of moves that you played, starting with queen d3? Yeah, yeah of course. I mean, okay, this this game was like a fairy tale because uh, I had so many emotions during this game, uh, starting with uh, when he... And we're back. Yes, Peter, you were saying? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that there were so many mixed emotions during this game because once you are hit in the opening uh, by your opponent, then you start asking yourself that, why did I have to repeat this uh, martial? Okay, the point was that it was the first real martial of the match because until that moment, Kramnik relied on anti-martial systems. And uh, that's why the shock was there that he, he entered it. And... Uh, and I immediately felt that this line that he's playing is very, very critical. So I spent like 55 minutes on my first reaction after he, uh, Kramnik played uh, his Queen F1 move uh, yes. because, uh, because it was such a shock for me. And uh, okay, I relied on my feeling, my intuition about this uh, opening. Was because this Queen F1 instead of Queen e when you went Queen H5 here? Exactly. I spent, I spent 55 minutes on Queen H5, yeah. So uh, cl clearly, I mean, there was no preparation involved. Basically, I was relying on uh, my experience from the wide side because I faced a lot of Marshall. 
and uh, after getting uh, so-called surprised, I felt like I want to pose as many practical problems to my opponent as possible. And the point is that Kramnik's preparation was just too good. I mean, that's exactly his, uh, I mean, that's why I say it was a fairy tale, this whole story. Because, uh, because I did not, uh, did not expect anything from this game. I just realized how strong it is, what he's doing. And he kept on blitzing. Uh, he kept on blitzing. I was taking my time. I was taking my time. And uh, all of a sudden, I mean, I was already slowly approaching time trouble. But the reason why I was spending time was that there was some move which was really disturbing me. You know, there was really something disturbing me. And in fact, it turned out that Kramnik knew that that move ends in a draw. And uh, yeah, we've got the board. Let's play through the moves and get to that point that you were talking about where you took uh, okay. five minutes as well. I think this was, this was game eight where you won and took the, took the lead in the match. Yes. So knight f6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5. Bishop b3, castles, and c3. This was the first big surprise because uh, until that game, uh, Kalamnik relied on anti marshals So I took, took the challenge, c3, d5, e5, knight d5, knight e5, takes, rook e5, c6, d4, bishop d6, rook e1, queen h4, g3, Queen h3, rook e4, the most ambitious, most critical. Yeah, black has to react with g5. And now white plays queen f1. And here you took 55 minutes on the board. Here I took 55 minutes because, uh, I mean, if you don't have any preparation, the, the question was, you know, I was trying to tell myself why queen f1 move was not taken seriously in, in the theory and why I never really analyzed it. Because maybe right. I have looked at it, but... And the simple point was that it looks like changing the queens with queen takes f1, king takes f1, and then some bishop f5 attacking the rook with the tempo looks very, very logical. Because you are coming with tempo and then rook a8, and okay, you did change the, the queens, but at the same time you are just very, very active and white is not developed yet. But then during the game I realized that Kramnik has no intention of moving his rook away from e4, and he will simply play f3 after bishop f5. And yes. he will always sacrifice this exchange and he will leave this rook on e4. And yeah. uh, I got really scared of this endgame because I felt like if in the endgame something goes wrong, then it, I will have no counterplay at all. So finally, by elimination, I used queen h5 and I knew that he will anyway rely on his f3 setup, but at least I have the, the queens on the board. I played bishop f5. Kramnik played f3, and I played knight f6. I think, because there are so many options, but uh, yeah, basically I wanted to make sure that this move, this rook moves from e4, because I will not touch it, I will not take it, but I will keep uh, harassing this rook, attacking this rook as long as it moves. Because if it moves, I will feel myself relieved. Then I feel like I achieved something. And uh, here, I mean, the reason why I'm not 100% remembering what happened because Kramnik, in my opinion, did not play the critical way. And after I analyzed, I had tons of analyzing many of the other cri more critical moves for, to my taste. I think he moved the rook. Yes. And, uh, and this was already for me some kind of a relief that, okay, he moved the rook. I think I continued rook a8. He took rook e8, rook e8, and a4. Yeah, and, and this already... This this yes. already felt to me a little bit strange because, uh, okay, this is, this is not the position I was afraid of, but since it was the preparation of Kramnik, so I had to try to understand what is happening. And I had this real worry that after Queen G6, his move is Knight E4. Because uh, how, to, how to deal with this? If you take Knight takes E4, F takes e4, rook takes e4 runs into bishop c2, losing material. Right. And uh, if I take with the bishop on e4, then white plays bishop takes g5. 
winning a pawn, I cannot take on g5, so white is clear pawn up. And right. uh, it's not really obvious that uh, how I will react to this. So actually, this was my big, big headache, and it was one of the reasons why I spent so much time. Uh, I mean, once the rooks were exchanged. Uh, however, Kramnik knew that knight e4 leads to a draw. You know, okay. this is this is exactly why I say that uh, he was very unlucky because if he would have, uh, if I would have played fast, then probably his choice would have been knight e4. He would have passed me, and okay, if I pass the test, draw, draw. But he felt like I'm already almost in time trouble, so this is a force variation. What's, was he playing very fast up till this point? Uh... He, was, he was playing very fast, yeah. I already spent like more than one and a half hours and I think he only spent like five minutes. And, and when it... you played AB5, your next move, how long did you take for this move that you played here? Yeah, I mean, when he took AB5, I was, to be honest, shocked because uh, the move Queen D3 I have foreseen uh, already much earlier. I mean, that was not my, uh, not my problem. My problem was that against knight e4, I, I was not sure how to react. Instead and of yeah, ab5. Exactly. Yeah, so rook e2, queen e2, bishop e2, b takes a6. Uh, to be honest, this position slightly worried me until I find queen d3. And, yeah, this uh, is a move. Yeah, and the point is, once you are a martial player, you somehow feel that after queen d3, once you spot it, you start looking at the variation, you realize that at least you have perpetual check everywhere, yeah? This, yes. is, this is what you, you need in order to be able to enter the line. Once Kramnik after queen d3 started to think, I started to think myself and suddenly I calculated all the lines till the end because actually black is winning, yeah? After yes. this, uh, all this... Uh, and yeah, I think this, you just come knight, e, knight g4 here. Yeah, knight g4, a8 queen, check, and king g7. This is amazing. And uh, white can't uh, save himself from the mate here. Yeah, white, white can't save uh, from the mate because, okay, I'm setting this queen f2. There were actually some lines where it was much longer, but uh, this was the whole the lines I'm winning. Yes. And then uh, when you played queen d3 on the board, uh, you knew that this position is winning for you already? No, no, I mean, not at all, because I simply had no time to, to really work on, on this position. I knew that this is safe for me, and uh, I felt like it, it's very dangerous for White. I mean, uh, but you know, the point is that it's, it's, he's still blitzing. I mean, uh, that's why I had all these mixed feelings that, what is it? I have no idea, but I mean, I can't lose it. And when he was Suddenly he slowed down and he was not blitzing anymore and he was thinking and then I realized that something went wrong I was thinking and I calculated everything till, till the mate and when he played this king f2 move Then it was already clear that this is uh, pressing the emergency button which which already does not exist Because uh, now I'm coming with knight e4 check and after king e1 this knight takes c3 was uh, was a destroying yeah, move yeah, a complete uh, demolishing. And this was the last blow in the game. But this is a, a stunning game, Peter. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts in this very, very historic moment. Because this is where you got the match lead with uh, seven games remaining in the World Championship. And, and the match score was 2-1 here, right? Yes, exactly. On the other hand, yeah, people also misjudge this game. Because the point is that, yes, the game... Oh, wow. And, and take a look at that, Peter. We've got some photographs up from the World Championship match. Yes, I, I see. Yeah. I mean, the point is that, yeah, the game really went like a fairy tale. On the other hand, if you look at the match, I was not, uh, I was giving up on Marshall after, after this game, you know. And uh, so finally, actually, Kramnik, it must have been uh, heartbreaking for him because he came up with an incredible deep, incredibly deep uh, new concept. And had a big time advantage and everything, and the game, how it ended, was a total disaster for him. On the other hand, uh, I, was, I was left without my main opening against e4 for the rest of the match. And uh, this actually had a huge impact later on, because uh, also people uh, tend to forget that how tough these World Championship matches are. I mean, we played 14 games, in uh, the whole match lasted something like one month. And all the tension, all the preparation and everything. And then finally you are getting more and more exhausted. 
and you cannot rely on your main opening anymore, it's, uh, it's double painful. So uh, in, in this respect, uh, I think Kramnik gained a lot uh, by putting uh, real pressure on, on my marshal despite losing this game uh, under dramatic circumstances. Yeah, but this game gave us a gem for, for ages. Let's move on to the next question because this World Championship match and this game we can talk about forever, Peter. Uh, the next question is by Jordi and Jordi is back with his rapid fire questions for you, Peter. Love them, Jordi. Keep them coming. And he says, hi, Peter. Keep up the wonderful work. Here are my questions. Let's pick a few of them, uh, Peter. Let's start with number six. Which superpower would you like to have, Peter? What? Superpower? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it would be nice to have some superpower which, which chess engines have. Yeah, I mean, just to stay calm when, when things are escalating. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at it uh, from the chess point of view, because I always felt like that uh, this, this was somehow lucky to me that when the tension was too high, uh, too big, then uh, I somehow lost my coolness. And uh, if I would have been able just to push a button during some timetable or something like, okay, Peter, now just calm down, and my heart would immediately react to that, uh, things, things could have uh, gone even probably completely different in my chess career. Peter, that is by far the most amazing and the most fascinating answer I think we've received for this question, because, you know, normally everybody goes for either to be the ability to fly or to uh, for like teleportation or to read people's mind or invisibility. <laughs> but I think this is the first time in the history of mankind that a superpower to stay calm in a difficult situation is uh, said. And I think it's a it's a it's an amazing answer and it shows what a beautiful mind you have, Peter. Well, the, the question was shocking me so much that I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I think it's your honesty, which everybody admires. The next question, the next question in the same series is that uh, if you had a time machine, would you rather travel to the past or to the future? <laughs> uh, definitely to the past. I mean, really? uh, yeah, definitely to the past. I mean, okay, there are so many cultures, there are so many things. I mean, uh, to, to have this feeling how it was to live in those uh, times, this is for me somehow much more uh, electrifying than uh, to, to try to find out what, what comes next. Okay. And I mean, for example, to go back to the 17th century Japan, I mean, how it felt to, to live in this feudalism and uh, my big hero in my childhood was Musashi, the legendary samurai uh, in Japan. And uh, okay, I mean, just to have a taste how it felt like it, it would, would be just uh, amazing. All right. And uh, the final question from Jordi's set of questions I'm going to take, which is, if you had a power, Peter, to change one thing in the chess world, what would it be? Oh. <laughs> 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 this is, depends in which direction I want to go, you know, but, uh, I mean, okay, to be honest, I, I would uh, really like to, to go back to the moments when the engines didn't have such an influence on chess. Uh, somehow this, this golden period of the 90s, when, you know, you really had to sit down at the chessboard to analyze and you had to analyze yourself, have your idea and then uh, check with an engine which is just helping you fix some problems instead of giving solutions because uh, this is one thing that I find really disturbing and uh, and uh, irritating in, in modern chess that we really have to rely on the computer so much and I remember very well the times of Linares and, and I do believe that this is, I mean, it describes the situation so nicely that when I first played my Linares, it was in 99, and I played with Kasparov, and after the game, we went to analyze together. Then all the chess journalists, everybody who was connected to this chess tournament was there, was elbowing each other, trying to find the spot 
trying to place their microphones, I mean, so that they can hear some, uh, some word from us, you know, the way we were analyzing with Gary and okay, it was just an incredible feeling. And later on, like in 2003, 2004, almost nobody was coming anymore. And I felt like it's so sad. And then we went out and we were asking the journalists like, yeah, what did computers say, you know? And it was, uh, it, wow. it, it was an awful feeling because this whole inner stuff, it's, uh, if I look at, uh, look back, uh, this, these tournaments were just so legendary. And this whole atmosphere and all these things that you don't know what is happening and you are trying to find out. And now suddenly you press a button and the button tells you what is happening. And this, this, this makes me sad. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting that uh, suddenly it's almost as if everybody can, can talk about chess and what moves should be made rather than asking the players who actually had the battle, who fought on the board. Every journalist is a chess player questioning why was this not played because they've got an engine with them. Yeah, exactly. And in this respect, if we suddenly think back what I already said about Japan and so on, then immediately the last samurai film with Tom Cruise comes also to mind and this dramatic scene at the end. This is exactly somehow how I feel like, yeah, when suddenly all these incredible fighters and everything are getting shot by some Horvitz uh, fire gun machine. I mean, this is, this is somehow how I feel about this, all these engine moves because uh, all this uh, human feeling, I mean, basically, I think I also in one of my commentaries were saying that, okay, I love this uh, movie from uh, Van Damme, Bloodsport. And it exactly, I think, also describes this moment when he is with closed eyes, feels all the dangers and everything, if they are trying to attack him or not, and how he fights blindfoldly. This is how I feel as a chess player, that the more skills you have, the more nuances you are feeling and you see all these kind of nuances which are not even happening but thanks to all your knowledge all this hard work and uh, everything your chess intuition uh, has developed so deeply and uh, and all of a sudden with computers this is not anymore that important yes fair enough um peter and i think that also like you said resonates with your answer about going back in time but let's move forward to the <laughs> Let's move forward to the next question, which is uh, by Saeed246. And Saeed says, Hi, Peter. I love your chess and your banter blitz are the best. Any chance you would do them more often, either on Chess24 or perhaps your own Twitch channel, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started this banter blitz. Uh, actually, it's a lot of joy. It's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, probably also for the simple reason that otherwise I'm not really connected to the to the outside world, and this is this gives me a platform also to to interact with people, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I believe that it will continue probably on on Chess Twenty Four. Uh, another thing, I have no idea how to open up a new Twitch or whatever. So for me, it's much nicer if the platform is done. I just have to come and then you know I do things what I do best, uh, just to play or to, uh, to, to comment on, on chess. But uh, yeah, I think it, it, it will continue. We definitely look forward to more of your uh, banter blitz, uh, Peter, because like you said, it was your first time doing it uh, when you did it last and uh, it did not look like it. It was, it was an absolute blast watching you play and banter at the same time. The next question, Peter, is by GM Aryan, and he says, how did you develop the preciseness and accuracy and how did you implement in your games? I tried it, tried to implement, but I'm not able to implement. Can you show your win against Caspro with some comments if possible? I really like your games a lot. Really a great fan. All right. So, Peter. Well, thank you very much. But actually, I mean, did I hear correctly that I won against Kasparov? Yeah, can you show your win against Kaspro with some comments, if possible? Yes, well, actually, I, I did beat uh, Gary once, uh, but it was a rapid game in, uh, in Frankfurt. I think it was exactly year 2000. And uh, that game I'm not that proud of. I mean, uh, simply, I was slightly worse. I was defending, defending, and I was defending very well, and Gary went crazy. I mean, yeah. he went low on time and uh, somehow he, he collapsed. But I mean, I feel like 
I had been uh, in Linares very, very close a couple of times to, to beating Gary in the classical game. Those are the games that come to mind when I, when I want to recall my memories uh, facing Kasparov. And uh, to be honest, it was really amazing. We had some incredible battles in, in Linares. And what struck me always that his incredible intuition in the time trouble. I mean, in the time trouble in all these crazy night offs, how many times he escaped and he outplayed me with, uh, with a terrible time trouble. I remember this game in 2001, when for the first time I managed to put Gary under, under pressure and he had something like two minutes for 50 moves or even more without increment. And Gary from that moment on started blitzing, played all the best moves and, uh, and he escaped from a very, very difficult uh, position. So, uh, yeah, this, uh, this, this game that I won against Kasparov, this is not so, not so relevant. All right. And what about his other part of the question, uh, Peter, which says that what if you could give him five, if you could give us five advice, five advices or five tips uh, to improve, to improve at chess from your experience that you've gained over years to the young players, what top five tips would you give? Yeah, and, and uh, now also I remember the, the, the question, which you now suddenly you were already maybe too diplomatic. You did not want to, to ask, but it was like uh, how to be so precise. Yeah, I mean, this yes. was also one of the, yeah. Yes. I mean, this, this precision, this is a very tricky stuff because the more you want to control your game, the more precise you have to be and you have to be, I mean, you have to give incredible amount of energy. So taking care of every single detail, not to give your opponent any counter chance, at the same time building up your position in order to, to put your pre opponent under pressure is a, is a true art and it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, whenever in my chess career I had this uh, privilege of uh, winning a chess game, when my opponent after the game said like, I don't know when I made a mistake, and this, uh, I remember my game against Grishchuk in Vikans in 2002, when Grishchuk after the game congratulated me on it and told me that he simply doesn't know where he made a mistake. He just made one small inaccuracy, which I managed to exploit in a, in a fantastic uh, manner. Those are the games exactly that I, I cherish the most uh, during my uh, uh, chess career and uh, that if I'm, remembering them. Uh, and of course, this is very tough. I mean, it comes with a lot of, lot of training. Uh, of course, you have to go step by step. I mean, you cannot really try to play immediately on the highest level. You have to learn, learn and be also patient. Yeah, this is very, very important because it was also not like uh, from one day after another, I became a very precise player. Yes, okay, everybody has his tendencies. Yeah, and one should also not change his character because there are some players who in chaos excel much better than uh, if they try to take things under control. So first thing I think is very important to know yourself, to understand yourself, what uh, really pleases you in chess, how you want to play chess. Uh, and then try to increase the level of these skills uh, to, to the maximum, yeah, because there are some players who simply need a chaos in order to, to show their best. For me, it was always whenever I could build step by step the position, that's when I could really show my best. So this is very individual. I believe one should never try to copy anyone. You have to try to learn from everyone. This is very, very important. I mean, uh, study all the classics. Uh, I think also one of these things that usually Every kid, every child has some uh, tendency that some champion he likes more than the other. Uh, maybe it's connected to some uh, first memory uh, with, with, with something. And then he starts to study those games. And usually those, uh, those periods have a huge impact. Yeah? If somebody starts to look at some chaotic world champion like Mikhail Tal, then most probably he will go in that direction. Yeah, for me, it was uh, Tiglan Petrosyan and Paul Keres, who I admired the most. And maybe it's also connected that in Hungary, we didn't really have many chess books. And uh, those two chess books 
were translated to Hungarian and, and I got to, to them at a very early age. So I was reading it like a Bible. You know, it's really interesting that you say, Peter, for you, the most, uh, in, uh, the best games are the one where it's not obvious where your opponent went wrong. And those are the most impactful game. And uh, uh, yeah, to learn from everybody. So if you had to just briefly sum up five tips for players to improve from your experience, how would you, how would you sum these up? Whew. I mean, okay, just... Uh... You have to love chess. That's that's the main thing because uh, the more time you devote to chess, the more you will learn from it. And yes. chess has so many palettes. I mean, it's there is so much knowledge involved and so on that I mean, it's impossible to describe in words. So I would just encourage to, to everyone to to love chess and devote enough time to it in order to really be able to benefit mm -hmm. and to to learn all the beauty and all these different aspects. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's never nice if somebody says that, aha, uh -huh, okay, just because I'm a positional player, then I don't respect uh, the chaotic players. And the same way, if somebody is chaotic and uh, then he doesn't like the positional chess because it has to be combined. And I think one of the reasons why Carson is so superior and such an incredible number one in the chess world because he somehow unites so many aspects and uh, he also combines the, the classical way of chess and all this modern evolution uh, and I'm really fascinated what uh, what he is uh, doing with his chess to be honest. All right let's move on to the next question Peter and it's by Shivika and Shivika says what is the most difficult challenge that you have ever faced in chess? Oh, I mean, there had been plenty. I mean, uh, the, I think the point is that uh, the, you have to improve and you are improving step by step. And uh, that's exactly the reason why I also mentioned the patience because uh, usually whenever, for example, somebody makes a big jump, then everybody expects that this jump will continue. Yeah, but uh, you cannot jump forever. You cannot improve so rapidly forever. And there are always some moments when you are stagnating, but those stagnating moments uh, actually are not stagnating moments. You are learning, you are getting much stronger. And finally, then after maybe some period of time, you are overcoming this. But those are the very, very challenging times because the public expects you to, to improve. Everybody starts asking the question, uh -huh, so why are you not improving? Are you maybe not that talented after all? I mean, there are all kinds of doubts coming up, but you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in the work you are doing. Yeah, this is very, very important. If, uh, of course, if you are not doing enough, that's why you are not improving, then that would be a self-lie. But if you feel like you really devote yourself to, to your chess development, and uh, then you are not yet uh, benefiting enough result-wise, then you have to be patient because Sometimes exactly, I had it in my career that my rating dropped. Uh, suddenly I was not having any invitations. I think it was like when I was 17 years old. Yeah, because as a child prodigy, I got all the invitations to the super tournaments. Yeah, that was kind of very nice because I learned so much. On the other hand, my opponents were still much longer than me. So it was very difficult to be really successful. So I was learning, learning, learning. So exactly when the moment I was thinking that now I'm already as long as they are, then suddenly I was not anymore the youngest grandmaster or whatever, and uh, my rating dropped a little bit. And all of a sudden there were no invitations. And exactly at the moment when I felt like now I'm ready to make my big next step, then, then there was nothing. And in this difficult period, it was in 97, I traveled to Cuba and I traveled to Colombia to, to play two tournaments. And I won both of them, uh, gained a lot of rating. And after this, I got again invitations. And that's when I made my big jump to get into this uh, top 20 uh, from like being one of the top 50, top 60 players in the world. So I know exactly that, yeah, there are always these difficult periods. But uh, if you believe in yourself and you keep on working, then usually you, you overcome those uh, critical moments. That's actually some great advice because I think uh, 
I've experienced it in my career and also in, you know, everybody I know in chess that they reach a level, but to make that jump to the next level is that critical period, which can be a very big challenge. And it's easy to kind of lose heart, but like you're saying, you have to believe and keep going in those moments. Yeah, definitely. And the point is that there is also a lot of pressure always from the environment. Yeah, if you are, for example, a young talent, a child, so-called child prodigy, then everybody expects you that, aha, uh -huh, your development, development will be very fast. But it's, it's not working this way. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not possible. So also for the, uh, for the parents, yeah, because they feel like, aha, okay, so I'm sacrificing so much for my child. I want him to improve and he's suddenly not improving. Yeah, don't worry. I mean, if you see that your son uh, really devotes himself and does what he has to do, then the result will finally come. So not, not to get too, too worried. I mean, I remember that also in my childhood, there were some critical moments because it was very difficult to finance my chess development. And uh, there were some tournaments where we traveled with my mother with the view that if this tournament will not be successful, then maybe I have to quit chess. Maybe I have to get back to school. And when you are like 12 years old and you are playing in a tournament uh, or a couple of tournaments with thoughts like this, then it's, uh, it's extra pressure. And this is one of the things that I wanted to make sure right from the beginning with Vincent that uh, there should be no pressure. He should enjoy what he's doing and uh, people should not have all these uh, expectations that, okay, every young boy can have a bad result, can have a bad period. This bad period, if he is serious enough and he's working, then he will overcome. And uh, that's, that's what I believe in. All right, some great advice there, Peter. And talking about uh, expectations and youngsters, we have a question from, in, from Inigu, Inigueto. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong, Inigueto. Uh, he says, hi, Peter. Do you think Vincent Kamer will be able to join the group of young talents such as Firuja, Esipenko, or Pragnananda? Do you think Firuja, Esipenko will continue to progress uh, to World Top 10? And do you see a player capable of facing Magnus Carlsen anytime soon? Yeah, well, I mean, I absolutely believe in this generation because now that I'm involved with, with Vincent, I'm uh, paying a lot of attention to the other youngsters as well because I feel like if they are in, improving, they are developing, it should be extra motivation for Vincent as well to, to keep on improving. So it's no way that I'm working with uh, Vincent and I would not be rooting for the other youngsters. In fact, I'm very much rooting for them. I was also very happy last year to, to play with Abdul Satorov together in the, in the build chess tournament. I have played against Praga, I played against uh, Sadvani uh, myself, uh, so I know exactly that uh, they are extremely talented. Nihal, of course, uh, I, ah yes, I played also last year with, uh, with Nihal. Uh, yeah, suddenly I already... Yeah, I, love that. I actually won that game, it was a, it was a very good game. Uh, but I have big respect for Nihaz. I mean, uh, one can see that chess is everything for him. And this is exactly how it has to be. And this is also what I feel in Firuza. I feel in Jesse Penko. And uh, that's exactly the reason why I believe that this generation will be extremely strong. Uh, you already mentioned the top 10. My big question is, uh, will be enough place for everyone in the top 10? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a big question. Regarding Magnus, uh, it's, it's a bit tricky because uh, the generation gap is too big. So I'm not sure that uh, Magnus really has to, to think about this generation, at least not yet, because this generation still needs time, but they are coming. And uh, to be honest, I'm very, very happy that they are coming because uh, completely new challenges are going to appear in the next uh, couple of years. And I think it's going to be even more fascinating and even more... Uh, uh, dramatic than, than at this moment, yeah? Because at this moment, it seems like, yeah, uh, Magnus is uh, dominating, he's number one. Uh, Fabiano and uh, Ding are very close behind. And then uh, players like uh, Nepo and uh, Maxim, Anish, and okay, a couple of other guys, of course. Uh, it's, it's always very unpleasant to to name many players because then it will feel like you left someone out. No, I have, I have respect for all the all the best players. Uh, 
but if all this new generation will come, it will be all the more exciting. Wow, so too many young super talents and too little space in the world top 10, huh, Peter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, I, I feel like this. And uh, to be honest, I wanted to, to say something regarding this tournament uh, with uh, the chess legends, uh, that uh, for me, it's, it's very, very nice to, to see this happen. Because I remember, you know, when I was like 11, 12 years old coming up, uh, then uh, I already met Boris Gelfand, Vish Yanand, uh, and they were already like uh, the absolute top stars. Yeah, they were like top three, four, five in the world. And I remember, for example, two stories with both players, which had very huge impact later uh, on my, on, uh, on the way I was also dealing with other youngsters and, and so on. For example, I played in Vaikanze, in the reserve group, it was just some small open where the second of Boris Gelfand, Alexander Huzman was also playing. Actually, Huzman also beat me in a very nice game, but this is not the most important of the story. The most important for me personally was that Gelfand, who was playing in the main tournament and was number three, number four in the world back then, would come every game to me and would come say, hi, Peter, and shake my hand, you know, during the game. It was just so touching. I mean, wow, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Then we, it shows this, uh, how nice persons they are. And I think that in, in, I was very, very lucky to, to experience this because uh, I'm not sure that in today's life, this is still so natural, but I remember. And then with Vichy in 92, in uh, Dortmund, he was playing this super tournament with uh, Kasparov and so on in the uh, legendary Westfalen Halle. And uh, one of the jour chess journalists asked Vichy, you know, here is Peter Leko, he's a young player, he's very talented. Uh, would you mind playing with him some blitz games? Can you imagine that during a tournament where you are very busy, suddenly somebody in the press room approaches you with this request? And Vichy, probably being too nice, too polite, uh, uh, too brilliant as a person, uh, he probably felt obliged to agree. And he did play blitz games with me. And uh, it was quite risky because I was already quite strong and he didn't exactly know me, uh, but he won every single game. In, uh, there, some games were really tough, but he really beat me in all the games. But I felt like, wow, it was so nice that Vichy really took the time and uh, took the took up the challenge uh, and i will never forget these things yeah? and i'm so happy and now we are uh, more than i mean 30, almost 30 years later in the tournament in the legend tournament of legends and we are still playing uh, with each other it, it was a very emotional moment it's it's just very nice to be part of this uh, uh, chess atmosphere and this chess people because I think that this shows the personality of the players, a part of being brilliant players. They are also incredible uh, personalities. That's really nice to hear, Peter. Uh, yeah, I think that the chess world is, is like a community. And at some point you've had, you've been colleagues, you've been competitors, uh, there are friends, and then you come across over the board and it's, uh, it's, it's a very different experience and a very special experience for sure. And I can't, I think all of us can't wait for this over the board chess to begin so that we all can see each other again. <laughs> Finally, not over a Zoom call. Peter, we've got a couple more questions. If you don't mind, I know that we've finished your time, but just a few more questions because. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't mind at all. I just wanted to uh, say this because uh, not that I forget this. This is simply my heart and I really wanted to share with oh, it's the It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. It's just so, impressive. Yeah, it's amazing to hear that. And uh, and yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Peter, the next question is by Combo. And he says that I recall once reading that you worked through all 1,817 problems in the informant encyclopedia of chess middle games when you were 10 years old. Is my memory correct on this? Is this true, Peter? Ah, uh, this, uh, this is the, co uh, the combination encyclopedia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is true, of course. Yeah. Oh, I mean, wow. Uh, and okay. he says that if so, how do you feel it shaped your development and style? 
Yeah, I think that uh, people actually really underestimate me tactically because, uh, I mean, not the top players, they know exactly that I'm uh, very dangerous and I spot tactics very fast. Uh, it's simply not my nature to, to attack. I mean, I don't feel the need to attack someone. I'm anyway happy just playing my chess. Uh, but uh, tactically, of course, I mean, my tactical vision uh, had been always uh, very nicely developed. And I believe, of course, that uh, it's very important that the more you learn as a child, all this goes very deep into you. Yeah? And it will always stay there. So if you improve your skills, for example, tactically, it's automatically, it will be with you forever. Yeah, and uh, that's why it's, it's very nice to, to work on, uh, on these tactics. I mean, I think it was also one of the methods of, uh, of uh, the Polga family. I mean, I remember that uh, because the point was that, I mean, when I appeared, there was already this example of the, the Polgars in, in Hungary. Yeah? So basically, thanks to this uh, experience, uh, that I have witnessed that where you can reach in a very young age like Judy did. It was, it was really motivating and you could understand uh, if you are working hard and you are really talented and you devote your time, you can be a superstar. If there would not have been this example of the Polgars, I mean, uh, in Hungary, it would have been probably much more difficult because you simply don't know what you can reach and where you want to reach. Yeah. In this regard, I think I was uh, very, very lucky with this, that uh, uh, Judith was in front of me and uh, I, I understood that I want to reach that level. All right. And the next question, Peter, that we have is from Isio. And Isio says, Dear Peter, it looked like you enjoyed playing in this event. Do you will you consider playing other online or live events in the future? And uh, is there a hope to see you in the Hungarian national team again? Yeah, well, I mean, this is uh, very tricky because uh, it was really very nice to, to play here. And uh, if there would be another tournament like this, I will be very happy to play. Uh, but I, I don't feel like I really need all these uh, online events. Of course, I mean, if it's, if it's a special tournament and it... I feel that it means something to me. I will be very, very happy. But uh, just to play, for example, some Blitz uh, Open on the internet, I, I don't feel the need to, to do that. Mm. Uh, regarding the Hungarian national team, I'm really hoping that finally once uh, things will get back to normal, because I would really like to represent uh, my country and play for Hungary. The only problem is that somehow the way it looks in Hungary, chess is now not supported. It feels like nobody really wants uh, to help. And it's like they kind of ask you to play uh, for the national team, but they don't understand how much sacrifices you have to make in order to play good. Because if I, want, if I play for my country, I want to play good. But in order to play good, I would need some support I would love to have a team of seconds or not a team, at least one second who is working for me. And uh, if I have the feeling that I can uh, show the level of chess I'm capable of, I'm really happy to play. But otherwise with all these obligations that I'm working as a coach, it, it takes so much energy. I mean, I remember that uh, people also in the Federation, they just look at my rating, they see my rating is dropping and they think like, uh, ah, okay, Leko belongs to the past. And once you feel like uh, they think about you like this, it's not really encouraging, yeah? Because I know exactly that uh, I'm capable of playing extremely good chess if given the circumstances. And if given the circumstances, I would uh, really find this uh, energy and inner energy because of course you need a lot of mental uh, strengths yeah. uh, to do this. But I'm also just very, very happy and satisfied right now as a coach and as a commentator and so on. So it's a little bit of a conflict of interest. But if from Hungary there will be this desire and readiness to, to help me to, to, to play the chess I believe I'm capable of, I will be very happy to return. Peter, tell me one thing, like you said, you really enjoy commentating and I think you, you're amazing at it because, you, because of your understanding your 
love for the game and your honesty it makes you just an incredible commentator let's say there's an event that you're invited to play or to commentate at the same event which one would you pick <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, when I was invited to to the Legends of Tournament, I felt like I simply have no choice than to play because I just want to be part of it. I I cannot. Uh, on the other hand, I also felt like it would be lovely to commentate this event. I mean, it was it was a conflict of interest, but simply I was just too curious to see what I'm still capable of, how I will react to this new challenge, and I'm very happy that I did it. because uh, i actually felt like uh, i i don't care about the result i feel uh, i care about this feeling and i felt that i can and uh, actually this feeling that i can uh, gives me a lot of confidence and uh, exactly if in the future hungary and federation for example things like yeah let's try to get the best team and let's fight for something i feel that i'm i'm absolutely ready because uh, this tournament was a very good example on the on the other hand yeah i mean commentating is is just very nice i mean uh, first of all there is no pressure and as i mentioned one of the things i feel uh, that right now a part of lack of practice is uh, is connected with my heart with all this tension and i also feel that if you play less then these things are bothering you even more because I'm simply not used to being in time trouble during this whole tournament also when I was in time trouble and it's online time trouble you know I just felt like I'm losing my orientation uh, but uh, if I would be playing much more often and you are used to the situation then it would not feel so alien to me yeah and then it would be much easier to 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 adapt to it like this that I hardly play and then suddenly I see my seconds are ticking down like against Vichy I mean it was it was a very nice example I think that in in time trouble I was down to like 10 seconds in a very complicated position with my king completely open and I managed to make some 10 brilliant moves and uh, driving Vichy crazy and once I'm completely winning and he's also done on time suddenly I'm blundering mate in one or two moves I mean with an with a move that simply you know the point was that this f8 square was protected during the whole game in the last 15 20 moves i yes, was taking care of this on this f8 square yeah and then suddenly i see that aha okay he cannot give me a check on f7 my king is on g8 and then i move with my queen to c2 and then it hits me on the heart but okay it's look f8 checkmate yeah. <laughs> i mean okay this is i, I mean how can you do this yeah and this this, this is uh, this of course if i would have more practice it would it would probably not happen i would be able to handle it better on the other hand probably it was very nice for spectators because it was dramatic it, it was, was definitely dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely dramatic i was not sure if i will survive it uh, health wise but uh, it was dramatic that's for sure that was an epic match peter that was an epic match <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, then finally I managed to come back, but uh, yeah, it... Armageddon was uh, really, uh, really amazing in that match. I think. Yeah, and also one of the things because yeah, I played some very nice Armageddons like against Vichy and against uh, Chucky, but I had one game against Gelfand, which I'm still, you know, very, very angry about myself. But it's, I think, again connected to lack of practice. because it's armageddon yeah if it's armageddon then it feels like your brain shuts off you want to play as quickly as possible and uh, one of the things that irritated me and i have no practice with it that i have to keep my mouse somewhere yeah ready for my next move and can you imagine that since i uh, when uh, during the whole event but then finally because there i had time i was able to handle it but I always felt that if I leave my mouse for example on one of the squares or on one of my piece then I it's almost like I touch this piece I have to move with this piece yeah and it it hit me exactly against Boris that in the Armageddon game I had my I was ready that okay my next move going to be a2 to a3 my pawn because I want to play a3 and b4 in the Malotsi structure and uh, I don't want to lose time so my mouse is standing on uh, on this pawn on a2 and uh, Boris played something like bishop f6 
which was the only move which changed the position because he's threatening to play knight d4 and take one of my bishops, which is the soul of the whole Malozzi. And uh, if, it, if it would have not been this Armageddon, I would have not been in this incredible state of mind, then of course I would have, uh, I have, would have looked at the position, ah, he wants knight d4, okay, let's stop it and continue. But my mouse was on this pawn on a2, and, uh, you know, I just automatically, instantly, because I wanted to play as quickly as possible, I played a to a3 and the lot knight d4, and after this, I even, I mean, I felt like I deserved to lose this game. And there was this tweet, and I don't know exactly, but I should already, if we already talk about this, I should mention it. Magnus was tweeting something that, yeah, Peter is maybe dirtier than you think. And then there was some position then uh, connected with, with this tweet, uh, when I saw that Gelfand was having a winning position against me, and he's, he had like 55 seconds on the clock, and he wants to repeat because he's black and it's enough to make, a, to, to make a draw for him. But you know, he has 55 seconds on the clock and I'm completely lost. There is no way I'm gonna flag him. But I also, I felt like, you know, I don't deserve a draw in this game because I mean, here I'm not completely lost. Why should I repeat? I mean, just he will win this position anyway in five or six moves. So there is not about any flagging. So then finally I lost this game and I read this comment actually hit me, I was very angry, and I was thinking like, okay, give me one more game against Magnus, because, you know, I mean, he doesn't know how I feel, then how can he make such a judgment, you know, because, I mean, it, it was really not about flagging, if Boris has like five or ten seconds left, then it's another thing, then you can, for example, uh, tell that, aha, okay, I want to win at all costs, and I'm ready to play dirty, but Boris had 55 seconds, and the game is going to end in five moves or maximum yeah. 10. So time is not an issue. So this, uh, this really hit me. It hit me hard. I, I think, Vera, you have many qualities, but playing dirty is not one of them. <laughs> and yeah, well, actually, one of the reasons I hate Armageddon that finally are forced to play dirty. Yeah? This is, uh, this is uh, I mean, I can't say that... Uh, I mean, and there's no shame in flagging in Armageddon because it's a big part of the format, of the format of Armageddon that you have to play on the clock. Yeah, that's, that's true. For example, there is one game that I still, you know, I have mixed feelings about. It was my epic match with, uh, with Grishchuk in 2002 in Dubai, uh, the finals of the Dubai Grand Prix. And we also got to Armageddon and uh, there I managed to flag uh, Grishchuk and I won the, uh, won the Grand Prix thanks to flagging him in the Armageddon game. But, you know, the situation was such that uh, he had 18 seconds and I had 13 seconds. So he had five seconds more when I started to, to flag him. So it was not like he had less time, uh, simply that at that point I also mentioned in yesterday's broadcast that in this 1999-2000 period, for example, at home, I was even practicing that with a digital clock, I could play three moves per second. You know, I could play three legal moves over the board in one second. And uh, I made good use of that uh, in that uh, final. And uh, actually Grishuk was very, very unlucky because uh, he was still like one second ahead on the clock when his king fell from his hand and he played absolutely correctly. He grabbed it and he put it back and he lost valuable seconds with that. And thanks to this, he lost on time. Mm. But uh, I still have mixed feelings about this that, yeah, I mean, maybe I should have not done it, but okay, nice. what to do? I, I, I won on time <laughs> like this, yeah, in that, that final. Okay, Peter, we have to, we'll, we'll wrap up with one last question from our, uh, from our members. And the question is by Magnus, C won't beat me and and he says if you could create your own chess variant what would its rules be what was regarding magnus no that's his username peter his username ah, okay. is magnus won't beat me <laughs> and the <laughs> the question is if you could create your own chess variant what would the rules be of it yeah to be honest i'm uh, very happy with uh, with the chess as it is I don't, I don't really feel that uh, there is any need to, to change. Uh, what I regret, I already mentioned that, yeah, unfortunately, thanks to all this computer advance and developments and too much opening theory, 
uh, this is uh, this is not good. I mean, I think it simply puts also too much pressure on the players. And I remember my conversations with Bobby, for example, when we were together and walking, and he was saying that you know because he saw the amount of work I was doing, and he already felt like this is not not healthy. And uh, he was telling me, can you imagine we are playing Fisher random chess? Then you don't have to prepare. Then the best preparation is to be fit for the game. And of course, that's that's kind of a dream scenario. On the other hand, with Fisher random chess or chess 960 or whatever you want to call it, uh, I feel it like uh, the, we are losing the the cultural heritage of chess. Yeah, because I mean, so many books have been written about openings, uh, and especially yeah for the for the amateur players, it would be a big shock because everybody has his kind of repertoire. Somebody likes the Scandinavian, somebody plays the French. He knows his little systems and it's easy for them to orient it and they can play. Uh, but for the professional top players, of course, this uh, immense this uh, uh, amount of variation, computer variation. And if you have uh, 10,000 pages, then you need 20,000. But uh, how can you remember all this? Then if there is somewhere some, some line not exactly working, it's a draw, then should you play it? Because if, if uh, the people, your opponent knows it, then the public will say, ah, okay, it was draw, it was not interesting. I mean, there are too many, uh, too many problems in this sense, but uh, with the chess rules itself, uh, I think uh, everything is it's perfect as it is. I couldn't agree more with you on that. And Peter, if you allow me, can I please squeeze in one more question because I really like it. It's uh, by Ma... Is that okay, Peter? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it's by Masa Katsu Agatsu. And he says, Dear Peter, I'm a big fan of yours. So thank you for making yourself available to us. With so little over the board chess possible at the moment, how should amateur players approach online chess to make it useful and constructive? Thank you for your answer. Yeah, I think this is now a challenge for everybody, not just for amateur players, uh, also for professional players, because in order to stay fresh, you have to, you have to play. Yeah, you have to play online. Uh, but at the same time, for example, the professional player have this problem that, okay, if I show my openings, it's not good. If I don't play my openings, then I don't get enough practice. In this sense, I think amateurs or, uh, I mean, not really professional players have a big advantage because they can just play the variations they anyway play. And this case, they are actually benefiting a lot because they can play a lot of games, get with different opponents, uh, get a lot of different practice and uh, actually come out of this crisis uh, even stronger. Yeah. So in, in this sense, I believe that yeah, online chess gives uh, very, very nice uh, feelings. I mean, very nice possibilities. Uh, simply, uh, yeah, I mean, I anyway don't know the dirtiness, but amateurs, I don't think uh, play dirty for flagging or whatsoever. I mean, uh, if you really want to improve your chess, then try to play uh, as correct as possible. Because if you give your chance, if you give the chance for your opponent to play his best chess, this case you are learning the most, yeah? This is actually always my, uh, this was my motto that I want to behave in the way that I never want to disturb my opponent because if I disturb my opponent, actually I'm cheating with myself because if he's not playing his best, then why am I playing with him? It's the best is to, to give him the possibility that he plays the best and then let me play also my best and then wow. we see what happens. Wow, Peter, that is absolutely incredible to hear. I think just your approach and uh, it also reflects in your personality, just how fair and honest and how you believe in just absolute fair play in all uh, in all scenarios. Thank you for being that way, Peter, because I think it's something that is missing from the chess world in today's time very, very often. And uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the members' questions. Before I let you go, I have to ask you, Anish Giri, Jan Nepomniashe, who's making it to the finals to play a match against Magnus? Yeah, it was uh, it was already a question yesterday in the German broadcast. Uh, I mentioned before the start of the match that I somehow have the feeling that it will be exactly the same like their last semi-final match. 
that it will be three, match, three matches and finally in the last game things will decide. I don't know in whose favor because it's such a 50-50 match and I couldn't agree more with Anish when he was saying in one of these uh, interviews that whenever he beats uh, Nepo, he beats him in a, in a good way. I mean, with very nice play and exactly the same that whenever Jan crushes uh, Anish, then uh, Jan plays some incredible chess. Uh, and uh, I think we have seen this uh, match that, okay, yesterday Jan was dominating. He was about to win today as well, but Anish came back. Uh, okay, I'm, I believe there will be a lot of, lot of uh, dramas. Uh, I just, before the show, because I was biking before, I just had a chance to, to look at the Armageddon game and I already felt like this was incredibly dramatic because it looked like Nepo is going to win the Armageddon with White and probably exactly with the move he thought that he's winning, he lost it. I mean, uh, it, it couldn't have been uh, more dramatic. F3, yeah. It was uh, it was a very very dramatic match and and brilliant comebacks from Anish at all different stages of today's match as well. Yeah, I mean incredible comeback from Anish, but uh, also incredible performance uh, of Jan. I mean what Jan did to to Anish yesterday. I mean uh, I just cannot yes. ever recall Anish losing with White uh, the way he lost the third game. I mean it was just some incredible massacre. From, from Jan and also today Jan uh, played an incredible second game. Yeah, when with Black he demolished uh, Anish and it already looked like uh, maybe the match will have the same course as, uh, as yesterday. And then Anish somehow find this inner strength, uh, probably also opening or something, the type of position helped him to come back in, uh, in game three. So yeah, this is an epic, epic battle. Epic battle and tomorrow is the final. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you obviously have many reasons to be proud. You're brilliant chess. You're a brilliant commentator. But I think for me, what I feel, the reason for you to be most proud of is that you're a brilliant person. And we, we really enjoy chatting with you. Uh, we miss you on our commentary. And we hope to have you back with us. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. And yes, I will be back. That's for sure, yeah. All right, Peter, good evening. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm Peter Leko. I'm very happy to be doing my first Bantablix. Also, let's see how it goes. <laughs>